May 3rd, 1863, the third day of the Battle of Chancellorsville, and 150 years ago the Confederate Army sealed what would be one of their most decisive and dramatic victories of the entire Civil War. On May 2nd, General Thomas Jackson had launched a surprise flanking attack on the Union 11th Corps in the flank of the Union Army. He had driven the 11th Corps back, nearly destroying it, and driving the Union Army into a salient, a dangerous position which could certainly be exploited. However, Jackson was wounded. Taking over command of the 2nd Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia ended up being General Stuart after General A.P. Hill was likewise wounded. Stuart led the Corps on May 3rd and successfully pushed back Union forces, although a decisive defeat would not come. In this video, we're looking at the command of General Stephen Ramasar's brigade. Originally, I was planning on looking at a Corps-sized battle, but I'd, I decided instead we'd look at a, a version of this game. Scur First of all, the game that we're playing is Scourge of War Chancellorsville. Um, but as I was saying, originally I was going to look at a core size engagement. I had been building each day of the battle and increasing the size appropriately. But I decided to look at one other unique element of this game, and that's called Headquarters in the Saddle. In that, what you can do is you can set your camera so that it won't allow you to get more than just a little bit above your commanding general, so it kind of appears as if you're in the saddle. More or less, it limits your line of sight to as if you were, you know, in a, on a horse in the middle of a battle. So here we have Ramasar's brigade, which is what we're commanding, partaking in a large attack of at least a couple of divisions on the Union forces on May 3rd, 1863. The third day of Chancellorsville was also the bloodiest, and one of the bloodiest of the entire Civil War. Over 21,000 men were casualties as a result of fighting. Fighting which for the most part took place over only about five hours, at least in the Chancellorsville area. On May 2nd, as I said, Howard's Corps had been driven from the Union right, and now took up a position on the far Union left. The Union army was shaped into something almost like a horseshoe with General Couch, General Slocum, and General Sickles occupying the heart of that horseshoe. Three Union Corps were exposed in a salient. A salient is a very dangerous military formation to be in. It gives a tremendous advantage to the attacker. If you can imagine a line of men shaped in a, in a horseshoe, um, you can obviously only get so many rounds off or shoot so many rounds off and when you're shaped in a horseshoe you have essentially fewer men and fewer rifles than the enemy around you um, it's hard for me to really describe but essentially the attackers can bring much greater firepower to bear against you than you can shoot back out at them so, in that sense, that's what a salient is, is called. Consider how many men you could envelop a triangle with, you know, the point of a triangle, versus the point of a triangle, you know, at the tip of, at the tip of a triangle, you've got a very limited amount of men who can, you know, shoot back, versus you can kind of wrap around that point and get much more firepower and much more destructive firepower in on it. So a salient is a very dangerous position for a defender. And the Union Army found itself in a salient on May 3rd. The Confederates launched their attacks on three Union Corps early on May 3rd. From 5.30 until roughly 10.30, the armies battled it out. The Union Army had good defensive terrain, they were heavily dug in, and the Confederates struggled to dislodge them from their position. Over 8,000 Confederates would fall in the attacks on this day. But eventually, after five hours of fighting, the Union were compelled to withdraw. It was not a rout by any means, but it was a victory. And it was important as well, because Lee's army started the day separated. McClaw's and Anderson's divisions started on the Confederate right 
roughly 13,000 men separated from the rest of the army. The divisions of Rhodes, Colston, and Heath. Heath had taken over for A.P. Hill, who was wounded. 28,000 Confederates on one wing, 13,000 on another, and in between the two, 73,000 Union troops. The devastating fighting on May 2nd really hadn't affected the Union Army long term. It was a psychological blow, and more than that, more than anything, it was psychological. General Reynolds' corps had arrived from Fredericksburg. General Hooker, who had originally divided his army into two wings, one of 52,000 and one of 40,000, was concentrating his forces near Chancellorsville and drew in General Reynolds. So an entirely new, fresh corps came to join the Union Army just as Howard's corps was badly crippled. Essentially, May 2nd meant very little in terms of manpower to the Union Army, who performed very well. Chancellorsville is also an interesting battle to look at, especially on May 3rd, because it was one of the rare times that Confederate artillery performed almost as well as Union artillery. This is something that was very rare during the Civil War, mainly because the equipment that the Confederates had was second rate. And unlike a rifle which fires a lead ball, and really as long as the ball gets fired it doesn't matter a whole lot, Artillery has what was called a fuse. The Confederate Army really, or the Confederate industry, really lacked the ability to manufacture these on a significant scale. So what ended up happening was very cheap fuses were in the weapons, or in the shells, or fuses that were smuggled in but were in bad condition through the blockade. British fuses would have been the most highly prized and most reliable, but the vast majority of fuses in Confederate artillery shells would have been second-rate hastily put together fuses uh, manufactured in the south. Now you might ask, what's the deal with a fuse? Well, essentially, during the Civil War, for the most part, except at extreme ranges, artillery would fire, it would sail for a given distance, and then explode over the, sh over the troops. You didn't want to explode a shell on the ground, you wanted to explode it in the air. And then it would rain shrapnel down on the men below it. This meant that you had to have a way to detonate the shells. A fuse was how you would do it. And essentially, what would happen is the fuse would have a set length, and you would tear the fuse at whatever distance the enemy was away. So if you estimated that the shell would fly for about three seconds before it would be over the enemy troops, you would set the fuse to last for three seconds. When the cannon exploded, that would ignite the fuse, and then three seconds later the fuse would detonate. Confederate fuses were notorious, however, for being very poor and unreliable, which is one reason that Confederate artillery almost always overshot Union troops. It was a key reason that the Union artillery in every single battle, more or less, had a decisive advantage against the Confederates. One exception might have been the Battle of Chancellorsville, where the Confederates got over 30 guns into perfect position overlooking the Union troops, and the Union gunners were at a disadvantage. Definitely an interesting battle for that reason. And as I said, after about five hours of fighting, where General Stewart launched attacks against the Union right side of the salient, and General Lee had Generals Anderson and McClaws launch attacks on the right side of the salient, or the Union left, the two armies would come together and the Union Army would withdraw. The Union Army did not break, the Confederates were badly bloodied, but it was a victory for the Confederacy. Meanwhile, on that same day, further east at Fredericksburg, General Sedgwick's corps had crossed the river there, the Rappahannock River, and had launched attacks against General Early's division, which was still guarding Fredericksburg. Sedgwick launched a pair of unsuccessful attacks against the Union positions near Fredericksburg. It might have been reminiscent of the Battle of Fredericksburg, which had occurred just months before, at the end of 1862, where the Union launched no fewer than 13 separate assaults against the heights to the west of Fredericksburg, called Mary's Heights. The attacks were in large part unsuccessful. At the Battle of Fredericksburg, there were a massacre. However, the Union was able to gather intelligence that the Confederate positions on Mary's Heights were very lightly held. Only one Confederate division opposed more than 16,000 Union troops 
Less than 10,000 Confederate troops were there. So the Union launched a third attack and drove the Confederates back. They would then advance west towards Salem Church, which is about halfway between Fredericksburg and where Lee's army was. This could have posed a serious threat if General Hooker had been more aggressive. There's been some speculation about General Hooker. He was wounded early in the fighting. Well, really more along the lines of about three hours into the fighting. He was wounded by an artillery shell, and that certainly could have played into his poor performance on the day. But Hooker was determined to take a defensive posture, and he received Lee and gave Lee all the momentum once again, all the initiative on May 3rd. Perhaps the same mistake he made on May 2nd, giving Lee all the initiative, not pressing Lee. General Meade could have swung around into Stuart's flank and potentially caused serious trouble. The same goes for Reynolds. Neither one of their corps was heavily engaged. Two of them were two of the best Union Corps commanders in the Army at the time. Meade would go on to command the Army at Gettysburg just a few months later, and Reynolds would be regarded as the hero of the Union Army. He was widely regarded as the Union Army's best soldier. He would fall at Gettysburg on the first day. Yet Hooker refused to allow his Corps commanders to attack. There's an interesting scenario here in Scourge of War, where you play one, uh, play one scenario as if Hooker had allowed you to attack his Meade. But, nonetheless, Meade was not to attack. And neither was Reynolds. So the Confederate attacks eventually put so much pressure on the three Union Corps holding the salient that they were forced to withdraw. There was no dramatic breakthrough. The Union Army did not skedaddle. They pulled back in rather good shape and ended up pulling back. May 4th would see more fighting again, but May 3rd was the real turning point of the battle. General Jackson had won a stunning success on May 2nd, but it was incomplete. May 3rd, the Confederate Army finished the job and drove the Union from the field. It's possible to say that more could have been accomplished. But nonetheless, it was a dramatic victory for the Confederates who were outnumbered nearly 2 to 1 by May 3rd. Here you can see we're driving the Union back slowly but surely in a very bloody fashion across this opening. The one thing I would say about this scenario is it definitely gives you the feel of what it, what it might have... I can't speak. What it might have been like to be a brigade commander amongst a much larger fight. The vast majority of these units are not my own. They're computer controlled, and you're not, yet they're not fully scripted. The AI does react to the going on of the battle. You can clearly see the limitations of commanding a brigade. If even only four regiments, double line makes it much easier because everything's easily within sight. But that's not always practical. Anyway, as I said, we are driving the Union back. We now currently hold our objectives. And this is just a nice uh, nice thing to take a look at here. Now, this battle was not the last of Chancellorsville. Further engagements would occur on May 4th. Uh, the Union Army would withdraw there, but the Confederate Army would deal with uh, Sedgwick's Corps, which continued advancing west towards Salem Church on May, May 3rd and May 4th. So further fighting would happen there, but this was really the wrap-up. It's amazing to say that Almost as many people died here on May 3rd as died in Antietam. Antietam consisted of over six, seven hours, of over six to seven hours of heavy fighting, intense fighting, between 40,000 Confederates almost always entirely engaged, and 70,000 Union troops likewise. At Chancellorsville, only three Union corps, Couch, Slocum, and Sickles, were engaged on this day, where only about 40,000 Confederates were engaged. Further, Sedgwick's Corps, which advanced over the river, uh, only had about 16,000 men as well, and it was going up against a lone Confederate division. So the Confederates certainly held their own here in this battle, um, but... What really impresses me, or s is surprising to me, is the sheer amount of blood in such a short period of time. As I said, over 20,000 casualties, and the main fighting in Chancellorsville took place between 5.30 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. But anyway, 
as you as I said, we're driving the Union here, um, and this is a headquarters in the saddle battle for those of you who may have just joined us. Uh, tomorrow's battle, I'm still debating on what I want to focus on, whether I want to focus on Salem Church or some of the other options. But either way, it will be done. Um, I'm going to cut this scenario short a bit, just because, you know, at this point in this scenario, I'm not doing a whole lot. I'm just kind of following the attack or kind of leading the attack, but we're more or less overwhelming the Union. So I will cut this a little bit short. Um... This is the 150th anniversary of May 3rd, the second bloodiest day in the Civil War. And it really doesn't get very much coverage, so I wanted to kind of focus on it a little bit. Um, you know, the second day of Chancellorsville on May 2nd is the day that gets all the attention in the press and the public and reenactors and everything like that. But May 3rd was perhaps more important. Um, Hooker could have recovered from his defeat on May 2nd. His failures on May 3rd compile, compounded with the failures on May 2nd more or less doomed him. Um, but anyway, as I said, I'm going to cut this video short here. That's all I really have to say at this moment. If you like this, go ahead and hit the like button. If you'd like to subscribe, definitely go ahead and do that. And uh, check us out over at thewargamer.com. Thank you, and have a nice day.